Hey, everybody. I'm Sean Robinson. I'm Carson Gruba. And today we're going to be taking a look at uh, something that's a little different for us. I don't think that we have taken a look at a single Marvel title yet, other than the uh, the G Jim Lee and Scott Williams, you know. Artist edition, yeah. Artist edition. Have we? Is this the first thing? I think so. Yeah, like an actual book. I don't, we're going to look at this very soon. I don't know if this was published by Marvel, but it's an artist. Yeah, I don't think artist editions count. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, this is going to be Marvel book. Yeah, first Marvel book. And in fact, uh, the first book that we've um, looked at that's actually published by a superhero uh, company. Uh, I, I think that uh, that ground is well trod by other people and people who like that type of stuff. And so we've sort of avoided that so far. Um, but uh, this is a little bit different in that we're going to be looking at a book that was for a really long time out of print. Um, we're going to be looking at the end of. Uh, the Marvel run of a title called Shang, Shang Chi, Master of Kung Fu, uh, and and I think uh, it is it collected in omnibus now. Like you can get the big, you know, like that big in two volumes. Yeah, I and I think that they did at least one printing of it, um, and this was collected back in like 2014 to 2017. And I think that they're actually all out of print again. Uh, mm -hmm. It looks like the cheapest one of Volume Four, which is what collected what we're going to be looking at today. Uh, looks like it's about a hundred bucks on Abe books, but that's 700 pages of a uh, book. So yeah, you know. those things are normally like 150 anyways to get them. So oh, gotcha. That actually okay, well, maybe cheap. Yeah. Uh, well, anyway, I, I haven't seen the collection and uh, for years and years, this was un unavailable. Uh, but the chief reason we're going to be looking at this today, for one, uh, you know, there was like a Marvel reboot and um, movie based on this recently. Uh, and I thought it was very interesting. They've basically thrown out all the stuff that came before. But, um, you know, despite its reputation, this is a really interesting series. And especially when it was firing on all cylinders, um, there was some really fantastic stuff that was done for it. And, uh, you know, a lot of that can be ascribed to the writing of Doug uh, Monk, who was uh, one of the writer, who was the writer basically from the fourth issue or something like that, almost to the very end. And then for my, uh, in my eye, uh, one of the things that makes it a really truly exceptional series is the work of an artist named Jean Day. And uh, Jean Day was a, a Canadian artist who started out uh, on fans, you know, doing fanzines and publishing his own work, and uh, basically drew every day for, you know, 15 years or something like that until he became quite an incredible artist, as we're going to see when we're looking at these uh, pages here. And uh, very interesting in that he uh, worked his way up from the fanzine community. He was cherry picked by Marvel based almost solely on his inking. Uh, in various fancy and things. And so he just basically sold to every market that he could make a sale and he worked and he worked and he worked and he worked and uh, was obsessive about it. And, uh, you know, was obsessed with comics and animation and uh, was a mentor to uh, Dave Sim, who later went on to uh, work with Cerebus, the, uh, do his self-published title, Cerebus the Aardvark. And uh, Day was heavily involved in the fanzine community he was really very interested in uh, movies that were uh, pushing boundaries. He was really interested in science fiction. He was really interested in fantasy. He uh, published his own zine that he was the editor of called Dark Fantasy. And uh, in the late 70s, uh, when he was in his uh, 20s, he all of a sudden got some traction at Marvel and he became basically a go-to fill-in inker guy. Uh, <laughs> when I say fill-in inker, they would ship him an issue that was on basically like rush deadline and he would turn these things around in a few days so he would turn around a 24 page issue in just a few days uh, became a master brush anchor who was incredibly fast and he worked with his brother dan day uh, and his brother dan day would uh, they had a whole procedure laid out and uh, dan day would uh, rule up the panel borders and uh, hand it off to his brother and uh, Gene would do the majority of the inking and he would leave all the spotted blacks for his brother and he'd mark them in with a little X. And uh, so they had a really efficient two man assembly line situation going. And uh, so he became a go to inker for the person who basically could turn these books around in an insane period of time. 
And uh, if you look at his credits, I mean, he did a wild amount of uh, Marvel work. And he generally uh, <clears throat> did fill-in stuff until he settled into working on this book that we're going to look at today, uh, Master of Kung Fu. And uh, Master of Kung Fu had uh, been a title that uh, started in the early 70s uh, when the David Carradine vehicle Kung Fu uh, was popular. And then it became really wildly popular when Bruce Lee's movies really took off. And um, something we'll, we're going to come back to, uh, Gene Day, we're talking about him in the past tense because he passed away at the age of 32. And uh, it's tied into his work on Master of Kung Fu uh, in a few different ways that we'll talk about uh, as we're going through these. But basically, uh, you know, Bruce Lee, uh, wildly popular, uh, you know, incredible uh, martial artist and film director, died at the age of 32 uh, as well in 1973. And uh, that really catapulted this book into being something really interesting. And uh, this book had only a few artists who worked on the title. Uh, and uh, in the 70s, as in, in the night, the, when the book, the series got into the 60s or 70s, uh, it was taken over by Mike Zeck and Gene Day started inking it. And at first, Gene Day was just the inker. And then gradually, uh, as Mike Zeck was finding other work, uh, Gene took over as the quote unquote finisher. In other words, the pencils were getting less and less complex as they were coming into him and he gradually got more and more art uh, credit. And uh, eventually, at uh, issue 100, which is the first one we're going to take a look at today, uh, Mike Zeck left the book and Gene Day officially took over as the penciler. And as you're going to see, he was, I mean, an incredible layout artist and uh, and really <laughs> way better than the guy he was. Well, I mean, in issue issue 100, they're both working on it still a little bit. Right. And 101. Like, yeah. I think, because they're both credited and the art in there is good. But then by 102, you're like, well, man, this guy's been pent up. He's been ready yeah. to go. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, he, and, you know, if you think about the the life of the freelancer, who's basically like, I mean, he's the mule. You know, if, you, if you're not on a regular series uh, or you're doing a regular series, but you're doing all these side things. I mean, they were just basically like, OK, Marvel team up is behind. Send it to Gene Day. <laughs> and then he inks it in a weekend and, and uh, he's on to the next thing. And sometimes the assignment would arrive while he was in the middle of inking the other uh, book. Uh, you know, he would get multiple assignments like, you know, right in a row like that. Anyway. Um, yeah. So so on the. Um, Mike Zeck uh, went on to do Captain America and, uh, you know, was a really uh, significantly popular stylist by the 80s. And by the 80s, I mean, Gene Day wasn't with us anymore. So we really don't know what it was that he would have done uh, with himself. And so one of the things we're going to be looking at today when we're looking at these layouts is sort of what we lost um, by having uh, this guy unfortunately die so young, when clearly he was not at the height of his powers. He was somebody who had finally gotten the break uh, that he was looking for. Well, it's Although not just the layouts, I mean, his his illustrative capabilities, the quality of art, just in terms of rendering and anatomy and all of that stuff, to my eyes, was like boom immediately. Like when he's doing it all the way through, it's like it gets better. Right, <laughs> and it's really interesting to compare it to some of the other now legendary artists that are, are in some of the fill-in issues too. So I'm glad you have those issues. Yeah, so we're basically going to take a look at uh, issues 100 through 125, the last one. Yeah, and and, uh, and we're not going to talk very much about the story. Uh, I I think that they are definitely worth reading, and I think that um, Doug Monk was a really inventive uh, writer who was very aware of the episodic nature of the book. And you know, the book reading them all in a row suffers from uh, the sort of typical thing of this time period you read them all in a row and you realize oh marvel editorial is insisting that every time they reintroduce a character they have to spend four pages talking about what happened before yeah um, and uh gene as an artist does a really interesting has a really interesting approach to that where he'll do these sort of montages these visual montages that bring back all of the critical things um well but, and i uh, think the i think doug uh probably realized the power it looks to me just I, I didn't read it because a I'm short on time b I have a really hard time reading comics from that era 
uh, see, like, to me, this whole thing is a celebration of what was going on in the art, and I could pick up right. that. But even with what was going on in the story, the longer they work together, the more it looked like it's being written towards what they realized this artist could do. And that's, I think, to a huge credit of a writer, you realize, okay, like this guy can pull off some cool tricks. Let's play. Yeah, there's a memorial, uh, a really detailed uh, memorial that uh, Dave Sim wrote about this, uh, about his friend Gene and wrote about this time. And he credits Doug Monk with calling Gene on the phone and just saying like, what is it that you want to draw? Because, uh, you know, you have this adventure title uh, that, is globally spanning the character shang chi uh is uh you know is the son of this uh villain this sort of like um is he's like the archetypal like other chinese villain uh, Fu from these type? Yeah, yeah fu manchu from <laughs> these uh, sam romer uh books Racist. from the <laughs> well yeah so so that's it's, it's it's interesting like that's the that's the the rap that the series gets uh but yeah. of course um the main character is like struggling against that the entire time i mean that's you know uh the way that doug monk writes him uh the main character shang chi is is struggling against this like genuinely evil figure who's his father which is actually a really interesting kind of primal struggle and you know you can see why that would appeal to uh, an artist to really get to draw somebody truly evil <laughs> um, and have that conflict as being one of the central ones. But anyway, this is a globally spanning series. So they got to draw whatever they wanted to, or they, they got to write whatever they wanted to. So Shang-Chi works for the British intelligence uh, office and he lives in a Scottish castle. <laughs> you know, his his hey, father hey. is an evil uh, warlord uh, who you know is a glo has a global spanning organization, so they can they do whatever they want. Cool temples, yeah. right? And so they, um, according to Sam, anyway, uh, Doug Monk would ask Gene what he wanted to draw, and that would be a big part of how he came up with stories. And you can just see, I mean, he's just like, well, yes, give it to me, I'm yeah. ready for it. And uh, that butted him up against Marvel editorial at the time. And specifically Jim Shooter, um, who was the head of Marvel at the time, who really believed and pushed for clarity in storytelling. That being the buzzword, you know, that you needed to like, be as clear as possible. Because Jim Shooter's idea of this is that you're selling all this to 12 year olds. You have to explain everything to them. You've got to make it so that they they know exactly where to go or where, where their eye goes. And that was a real conflict. And it didn't really seem to matter to Marvel editorial that as Gene was working on the series, it got more and more popular. It, the buzz that they built was like, there's this really cool thing happening. I've never seen pages like this. And Gene was taking yeah. this Duranko influence and just ramping it up. I'm going to take this and I'm going to make it bigger. I'm going to take this. And I'm going to make it more exaggerated. And you're, you're going to see this as we're doing the flip through. So maybe we should just go to the flip through. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's get it. And I, I would say this is more of a celebration of, yeah, his art than the series in general. You know, yeah. that's that, at least that's how I was looking at them when I was prepping for this. So, yeah, yeah. let's let's take a look at these. So we're, mm -hmm. we're going to take a look first at issue 100, which is still uh, and I think this is instructive. It's it's a combination of Gene Day and Mike Zek and you. This is where when I was looking at it, you know, this is a good issue. But then once you get to the one that Mike Zeck's not involved in, you can really see that to me, it looks like an artist that has been inking over people who are kind of inferior to him <laughs> getting right. to be like, all right, let's go now. Uh, I, he definitely did the first couple pages, though, at least. Yeah. So so um, the way that this one is split up is that uh, Gene gets to pencil the first story. I, I think this is essentially a tryout for what he's going to get to do. And uh, and then Mike Zek is the uh, is the penciler for the second portion of the story. So these are the very first professional pencils that Gene had done. And, um, you know, the very start, we've got a, a, a story where We've got a location that's obviously been selected for the visuals and that that's taking place in Egypt. And um, one thing I can say about the very first Gene pages here is that um, his, his points of reference, things that he's actually referencing or using as photo reference or whatever, are a little bit more obvious in that they're not quite as integrated as the later ones. 
he was obviously somebody who used um, a lot of reference and, you know, very much paid attention to sort of the mechanics of a gun, making sure like all of his firearms and things like that have all of the, um, you know, would actually be functioning. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and a real, a real stunning designer, like going back to that first page, that's what continued to strike me throughout the series is, um, I see a lot of people who do art like this now in terms of their sense of design across the page, but really good sense of like black and white contrast going in the the patterning that he has in there, you know, in the the using those old sculptures and stuff like to create design elements is really fantastic. Right. Spotting and, the and, blacks. And you can see that just from the very beginning, he's already in to that. But we're going to see much more like spectacular examples of it uh, as he gets going. But yeah, look at something like this. And this guy right here, this is, uh, I would I would bet good money that this is a referenced um, uh, from Gene Day's brother, Dan. Yeah. In uh, terms of yeah, pretty accurate the, the facial structure. Um, but uh, also right here, we get a goldfish uh, shot. <laughs> uh, which is going to come back in a later issue in a fairly spectacular way <laughs> yeah actually that's funny because i almost had you mark that page i didn't but i didn't connect it that's because that's quite a bit later on i think it is yeah about 10 issues later we're going to see a, a a fight that has a goldfish shot where you're looking through the um through the a, a fish tank you must have had um, a goldfish should ask dave did gene day have a goldfish <laughs> Um, and so this first story right here is essentially, I mean, his tryout. And you can see that some of these things are obviously like referenced and he's working those references immediately in there. Um, and as you were saying, really, really page aware in terms of composition. In fact, in a really unusual way for the time, we're going to see some of his layouts uh, later and we're going to get an idea of why he might have irritated uh, Marvel editorial uh, because he relies really, really heavily uh, later on on using a double page spread units, not necessarily like across the page, but using each page individually and then together. And uh, you don't see that any any of this yet, but that was actually a really big, that type of thing was actually a point of contention with editorial because they wanted to be able to insert bubblegum ads wherever they wanted to. Oh, uh, and, and look at that, that bird, that just graphic bird laid over top of the, on the right there, that, mm -hmm. that is so designy, like the meta design of the page instead of panel by panel. And that's the type of stuff I was seeing that feels so contemporary to me. So I saw a lot of, and I wonder uh, if J.H. Williams, the third was looking at a lot of Gene Day because, and uh, who's that other cat that's kind of like. Uh, I'll try and remember his name that, that also does a lot of Batman stuff. Um, now works with Jeff Lemire on the book Primordial and Andrea Sorrento or something. Okay. There's a couple artists that do these like cross page kind of design. That's even if they're not doing a double page spread, it's very aware of that um, using like border elements and stuff for design. So I, I see a lot more of this type of thing in today's current superhero books. And I wonder how much of that is derived from this now that I've seen it. Yeah, or uh, or possibly a Storenko uh, influence with, you know, it was definitely the primary influence on uh, Day's layouts. Uh, but yeah, this, this is a really unusual thing to hear this white negative space of the foreground figure. And we'll see a bunch of those really interesting uh, usage of that later on. Uh, in the book. I also got to say, this is, these issues have some of the worst coloring I have ever seen in my entire life. If you <laughs> want to get an idea of what a bottom tier book this was and how it was regarded by Marvel editorial, you can look at the coloring. Um, this right here, you can just see how shockingly bad uh, the, the, there's just no attempt whatsoever of color trapping. So, you know, this yellow is going to be printed over the black this very, very weak black. And it's just the most random shape cut out for the yellow here. It's not actually trapped to the form. It's just this random blobby yellow across it, which makes some, for some very odd sequences when, you know, the, the things are very dark. Seems um, normal to me for old comics. I don't know. Maybe like that weird color trapping to me is just part of what I think of when I think of old comics. I would well, also say like, 
I bet you if you saw this thing in that omnibus form, it would be like really horrendous because the omnibus they strip out the desaturation that you get usually marvel right. <laughs> they strip out the desaturations that you get and print them super bright which for kirby works but on someone like gene day wouldn't uh, can we go back to the 100 and look at some of the mic or no you got yeah, 102 sure. which 102 has mike zach art in it right uh i i don't think so um and i actually don't have 102 i actually have to go straight to 103 for the for our flip through but we can take a look uh, at some your okay one yeah let's go let's go back because then you go to the mike zek stuff and and you'll see you'll see what gene day had been inking over for like probably 20 issues or more right right and and like to me imagining a guy of the caliber that he obviously is working over obviously inferior art in, in both in terms of like just anatomy and rendering and lighting and all of that but also just composition like the but, spotting of blacks the ingenuity of composition the the design aesthetic right. of it like this is the mike zek pages are comparatively pedestrian in terms of how they're put together yeah they're not uh, bad it's it's not no. bad art it's not bad comics it's just Gene Day is is obviously like a level up from that. And Mike Zek does a lot of the cool, like stable camera kung fu scenes that Gene Day then carries on that strategy, like that page right there. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's being derived something that I miss from movies, which is the the stable camera, like longer fight scenes. You know, it's not right. just all quick cuts and you get that better. The the uh the choreographed fight scenes from the old kung fu movies and they're doing a lot of that in the comics uh, but i think uh, it, i think when you get to that in later issues like gene day pulls it off in much more interesting ways too yeah it's interesting to note uh mike zek was a fan favorite in the 80s so a couple of years later he would be somebody who was really highly regarded and would basically bring in you'd bring in to do like a single issue that you really wanted to punch up the sales or make a cover or something like that and uh, interestingly the first time I ever saw a Mike Zek uh, page was for um, what's it called? Uh, GI Joe. He was brought I think in. Punisher. To... Oh sure, um, he he did a a, a bunch of uh, he did a fill in issue of GI Joe and he did a bunch of covers uh, for GI Joe, and uh, I, I think that there's a there's a lot to be said for these series relating to gi joe in a certain sense in the sense that like there were actual good comics made with a fairly weird licensed title um yeah. and and also somebody who uh, a series that had a really long run with the same writer who was a very good writer who could then tie in all these different threads but it led to sort of like a you know apathy at the editorial stage because they're like well this is somebody else's thing that we can't really touch we don't have as much influence on um, you know, it's got all these weird connections, like back 80 issues, who the hell has read 80 issues of any one comic, you know? Yeah. So anyway, yeah, so just let it be right. Exactly. Uh, so Mike Zach is a comp is a reach back to that as well. Um, but yeah, you can see that Mike Zach stuff. I mean, he's, he's a really good stylist. Um, you know, his anatomy is great. Uh, but very, very straightforward pedestrian layouts. I don't mean that as a shot on him either. It's just compa the comparison <laughs> is like yeah, very striking. That's what that's what like really jumped out to me is I know Mike Zek was a huge name artist at the time. And we'll we'll see towards the later issues some other people who went on to become some of the biggest names. And Gene Day's blowing them all away. Right. And it's like, uh, but we never got to see we got to see where all these guys went 10 years, 20 years later but we don't get to see where this guy who's already doing stuff that's like as good as contemporary comics. Like right. if this guy could have gone off and done his own graphic novel and not been screwing around on a Kung Fu book, like, Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So it, no, that's it's, shame. it's true. And it's a, it's a real, you know, it, I, I think it's an indictment of, uh, of uh, the comics, it, you know, the, the way that the comics field was set up at the time that um that that was the case that he didn't get to fulfill you know his potential in that same kind of way um so, so this, this is, is his a, second full issue 
this this would be his third. Uh, no, yeah, yes, uh, 101 and 102. So this is his third full issue. So we're skipping ahead slightly just because I don't have 101 and 102 here. I think 101 um, was all Mike Zek with him inking still. And then gotcha. 102 was him all by himself doing the layouts. Okay. And right there, boom, look at that. Yeah. Page. Like, it's not just a... It's not just a cool pinup. It's a beautiful piece of design. It sure is. And uh, use of the color hold here instead of uh, leaving that in. I mean, it's obviously obvious that he's like indicated it on a different artboard or something like that and instructed the colorist to pop that in with the magenta. And uh, yeah, and, he, and someone who obviously understands the whole, he understands comic as an entire process and as a medium. You know, he he seems to understand every aspect of comics and really puts that like this next spread right here. <laughs> That's so cool. A city, a sea. And this is a trick he does a number of times where all the panels become words as well. Yeah, he gets more and more sophisticated with these. And it's a very interesting take on the sort of Eisner splash page title thing where he's actually using the 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 layouts themselves, the um, panel borders themselves to form the words. Uh, and this is, um, uh, this is an interesting peek into, you know, sort of how to comp another way to sort of compose a page that has really not been used as far as I can tell, um, has not well, been used in comics. This stuff is here. more common now, like I said, I know you don't read as much of the superhero stuff. So you get more things like this now, even in the superhero books. Like I said, like J.H. Williams or uh, Andreas Sorrento, I think is the name of, of the fellow I'm thinking of. I'm okay. much more likely to do these, these meta designs. You can see some bru uh, juicy brushwork here. And then this with the characters having these bands of black from shadows across their faces. This is a motif, a visual motif that he loves and comes back to over and over again. And and um, I relate to, you know, knowing that him and Dave hung out a lot. I see a lot of shared uh, design devices like that. You know, Dave mm -hmm. always liked it, like the those kind of uh, shade shades, shadows, the shadows from the wind shades. He, he liked putting those in the background. And like the next page has a, a pretty typical like Dave Sim type of move to breaking up uh one background into three panels and having the characters filmically walk over it and gene day does that all of the time in in the same yeah. kind of rhythmic style that dave would too so you can see this that playing yeah and, and and this is an influence from uh Starenko, but it's something that both of them took and basically made their own and almost nobody else was doing it uh and this is the the you know one of the first instances we've seen of the thing that was actually going to get him in trouble with uh, Marvel editorial, uh, really? We're gonna go. That, they thought that was not clear storytelling. Well, we're gonna we're gonna take a look at uh, the the, <laughs> the actual issues that caused him problems. Uh, okay. So this is uh, that's one hundred and three, and you see uh, some of like uh, where he would have been looking at Al Williamson's like Secret Agent Corrigan, and right. why that's something that even though Dave didn't really talk about it during Cerebus when he came back to Glamour Puss, like. That was something that they were obviously looking at together. I'm sure. No, I I, I think you're you're definitely right. And uh, and as far as it getting him in trouble, um, Shooter actually decided that that was an example of poor storytelling specifically, and this became like a heated thing between the two of them, um, and editorial back and forth. And at one point, uh, Dave, who is the source for most of this information, you know, he was. Like I said, Dave's or he was a uh, Gene's friend, and they would talk on the phone all the time when they were working. Dave would go up and work with him, or uh, visit him. You know, they lived you know a couple hours train ride away from each other. Um, they, uh, according to to Dave, uh, Shooter actually said specifically, "Stop doing this thing." At some at some point, you are not going to do that. You're not going to have characters walk across the background. And Gene told him, "Well." Uh, it would work fine if your colorist would color it right. Uh, <laughs> because the, the colorist that they had working on the series at the time um, was sometimes coloring some of the panels as if they were taking place in different locations, what oh. should have been a continual background. 
Wow. And what Jean didn't know was the colorist was Jim Shooter's girlfriend. Oh shit. Okay. So not on this issue then, because on not, this issue it's George Russo. Yeah, not on not on this issue, yeah. Okay. Um we're coming to that. Uh but that that apparently became <laughs> Uh, another issue i just love these like Im implication of detail without detail uh black fill-in things these are like and, impervious to bad reproduction but and just he's look. so good at sculptures like drawing sculptures yeah it's just a really interesting and mostly defunct way of rendering uh that's really fascinating to me well that's when you can't trust your colorist that's what you do right <laughs> now exactly. it's just like now it's just like put a thin line and let the colorist do the rest <laughs> uh i thought this one was interesting uh we we see these uh this advancing camera close up that uh has his imagining of the the guy he's about to fight kissing his girlfriend <laughs> between each panel yeah so he's have... really good at that too like the camera pull in, pull out, shift up, shift down. And that's pretty cool to intersperse something else in between it. Yeah, right right in between it. And, and those two being also close-ups of each other. I mean, it just kills me. Absolutely kills me. It, you know, you don't have to know anything about the story in order to be like, holy moly, <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah. It, we, and we and then little... I'm always, you know, I'm always talking about rhythm. So the rhythmic musical quality of that too like i don't know anything about the story i don't know that that's his girlfriend you know like i said i didn't read it but just from a purely visual standpoint the rhythm of it is so compelling and that's another thing where he's probably mad at the colorist fucking it up because the colorist has this dark cool panel in the middle of it right like maybe deadening the rhythm like you need a rhythm back and forth in the color too yeah this should be part of that same sequence they should visually be part of the same sequence but he's breaking it up whoever has colored this this panel here has, has broken it up by by um by popping that purple on there yeah it should be like reds 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 like red yellow red yellow red yeah exactly and then we have the explosion here which has a yellow back so we've unified the two yeah uh, together into this explosion of an attack and uh this this is a a, a really good issue from a writing standpoint where we've got the conflict between the two people who are really not that bad together they actually want the same similar things um they've got this nazi experiment that they're trying to basically destroy um but the conflict between their their personal conflict between them is go, interfering go back with two pages go go back to the other that that walking forward page and the 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 figure on the right hand page that covers over multiple panels. Yeah. That's another one of those things where I just think like this dude, not only is he a great designer, like he draws ass off. Yeah. It's just fantastic. Once, once again, all white and black, look at the minimal amount of hatching that's happening here. Yeah. Just um, feathering. It's a, it's, he's really a sophisticated renderer. This is obviously referenced. Um, but yeah, it's b sure. better integrated than those first that first issue we looked at. Um, I feel like maybe he was a little bit like nervous <laughs> about this first outing, and he kind of like made the reference stand out unintentionally a little bit. Um, if you wondered how he achieved this, once again, very interesting to see Dave, who you know is, has an eye for all of these kinds of things, and was obviously continuing to learn from his friend. Um, according to Dave, when he would pencil these pages. Uh, it would be a huge mess, a mass of uh, transparency. Uh, he would use uh, he would use uh, tracing paper to work out all the figures, and he would move them around exactly how he wanted them to get them exactly in place, uh, with the pencil side down. And then his brother Dan would come in and transfer the figures for him, which from... Dave still does too. So Dave has like picked up that technique and with strange death i mean we published that ancillary book of dave's tracing paper sketches so dave was obviously still using that multi-layer collage method it's like pre-photoshop like okay i can have all these elements and then move them around and think in, in terms of page right. design yeah. and if you look at how complex his designs are i mean you get the idea why he did that in the first place i mean 
uh, and and then there's the interesting time saving method of having the little brother around to <laughs> trace him off, and then he could go in and finish off you know yeah. whatever pencil rendering he needed to do. Uh, right. So interesting, even though he was the inker on all of the books, the the ones that he penciled, except for a few, uh, he wasn't able to do it all in one step because Marvel editorial wanted to approve his pencils every time. So he would uh, send the book into Marvel editorial. They would approve the pencils and uh, get it lettered and then send it back to him for him to ink. So he um, was like really his own inker. <laughs> like yep. here's the whole package go three days. Exactly. Oh, Jesus. And uh, you can see him running out of time in a few of the issues uh, that we'll take a look at. I thought this was a really interesting one where we've got the panel border, the chain dividing it. And then the yeah. very last panel is the actual implication of the chain being dropped in the water. <laughs> yeah, that's a cool. It, it, I, w I stopped and looked at that one. The only one I didn't, the only reason I didn't want to talk about that one personally is because I was hoping that it was, it was uh, essential to the image in both the first and the last panel. Like it was right. being dropped out <laughs> of one into the other. So it set like a time sequence of like everything in between has happened and the time it dropped from the one to the other. Because that's the kind of stuff, I, you know, I kind of expect from someone what? who's this powerful. He, he manages that in later ones. So we're actually going to revisit this exact trick, but with, like you're saying, tying it to the beginning as well. Because here it's just sort of a odd distraction until you realize what it is. Yeah. It's almost purely a visual motif until you hit the last panel. Um, let's see. We're going to speed up here. Otherwise, we're never going to get through all the goodness that we want to. Yeah. Um, I thought this was <laughs> fantastic here. Once again, we have um, a mo camera move in where we've got these figures in the, the, the statuary, the commenting statuary, which is fantastic. And then we move in on the figures and then they move into the center and we see the two people who are watching them. Yeah, and that's really abnormal for the time too because that's that's what Scott McCloud calls like the aspect aspect where those are all three happening at the same time. Yeah. And you're just seeing different aspects of the same scene from different angles all at once. That seems very unusual for an American comic at the time as well. I see a lot more of that now. Like I think of uh, Paul Azcateca on, on Robert Kirkman's Outcast. He'll do all these little insets of expressions that are happening in a larger scene. Mm. And I, I really like that strategy, too. So that again, I'm seeing all these things that are way more common now and yeah it's just like he was he was downloading this shit from the future there's something else in here too that he downloaded from the future which is interesting so i, I want to know <laughs> what kind of hash him and dave were smoking <laughs> uh yeah he chain smoked uh, cigarettes apparently i don't know about any other recreational drug use after his uh his teens apparently he was a real hellraiser until his 20s and oh, uh, he, he saw something look at that stair it, scene he loves stairs by the way he's he's the master yeah. of stairs on a page this is this is a little cerebus nod here i don't know if you saw that yeah yeah he's got the cerebus statue and i mean dave does a lot of this stuff with the stairs and the temples too you know dave's yeah. a really sophisticated master of stairs as a design element and that's we that single the... background so they thought that was bad storytelling yeah, um, this is apparently this became a back and forth with him and Jim Shooter, where it would get flagged over and over again, and he would ignore the, he would ignore the direction to stop it. And this one is the first example we have of an entire page of the action inset across a continuous background on the stairs, uh, <laughs> right? And it's with the stairs. It's brilliant. So, hey, Jim Shooter, go fuck yourself. This is amazing storytelling. <laughs> you don't know anything about comics. <laughs> Is, is yeah. Jim Shooter still out there? Is there? Is he alive? I don't know. Is yeah, he... see, he's he's alive. Uh, okay. And, uh, well, if you're listening to this, this is amazing storytelling. I don't know what your problem was. You know, I I think a lot of these things might just boil down to interpersonal conflicts uh, and sort of ongoing issues. You can imagine somebody at editorial reads this after it's published and says, "Damn, you know, I read that panel before I read this. Like, this just a little oh. off." Come Next on, time, Gene, reads. I need I need to look at this, right? And then he ignores it, and then you're like, "Well, look, I told you before, 
And then by the time you're like 20 issues in, you might get irritated by the fact that the, the sales are up 20%. Don't, don't turn the page. It, it reads perfectly fine, by the way. But also look <laughs> at the mid tier on the right page where he yeah. goes into that intersection with the white shapes again. Unbelievable. Genius. Yeah. Absolutely genius. How do you tell these things apart? And this is so comics. I mean, he's reaching across the border and he is turning into the foreground object that is not present. I mean, yeah. what it, you know, this is the stuff that really gets my juices flowing because like, how else do you do this? What other medium do you do this in? You know, this yeah. is not something that's going to be in your film adaptation. And, and here within the context of this, I don't know, I didn't read it, but it doesn't have too much meaning. But I've seen people, I think I have a photograph of a Dave McKean one where it means something it's like the the absence of a character in your life you know someone who's died has this trick and that's where i think gene day was doing this stuff a lot of it for just design purposes and it, i think if he stuck around he would have and, and been more in, in control we would have seen him start to do really powerful emotionally resonant things that it ties together to the story too um talk about yeah. drawing Look at this, the, the, the shadows crossing across this figure here. Yeah. I mean, it just, it's killer. Amazing. Absolutely killer. Um, and, you know, we have the large shape. pages. Yeah. Yeah. We uh, keep going. Once again, <laughs> yeah. So we, we got, we got to keep on blazing through here because like there's, there's so much to look at. I mean, we're, I, we're... I want to get that omnibus, but I'm so worried that they have like <laughs> that bright, shitty coloring um so if someone could if someone has this in the omnibus form and yeah, we can would love tell it. us a, 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 if uh if the coloring is that really bad coloring go go back to um oh no no, no. Cover. go <laughs> the cover's a little crazy his covers are really this, that's a yeah I, that's not my favorite cover by him his covers this, are this, this guy razor hand or razor fist and then these are the, the ones that we'll actually meet who each have a single one. Uh. Like the, the, the page two and three, he's always got a killer opening page, but there where he's got his big razor hand, I just want to note that shape because he uses that later on. Yeah, and, and notice the, the face of the guy that he's menacing in, reflected in the razor hand. <laughs> yeah. And um, like, good for Gene Day for drawing this absolutely bananas stuff. <laughs> and still making it look cool because this should look cheesy as hell this here where he's got the he's taken something um he's taken the the bead curtain and he's made it a motif through this whole thing where this guy's menacing these people and he cuts the bead curtain and we see all of them dropping to the ground you got batman's <laughs> mom with her pearls <laughs> <laughs> i just I, it just kills me uh really just kills me uh, I only flagged a few pages in here, but really this whole this whole one is is totally bananas, including this flashback sequence where so that you can, you know, Marvel editorial insisting that everybody should be able to read each issue independently means that we have like a four page flashback so we know who the hell this guy is. <laughs> and, then, and doing a lot of cool like circular versus square panel borders. Yep. Yeah. All the flashback ones taking us back in time with the with the the rounded off corners. And this this figure imposing across there, right there, and unifying this uh, compositionally, really, really nice. And then we get, you know, the bondage gear girlfriend of the it, razor razor fist. And, guy. and on the uh, on the left page, there are a lot of cool panels piling on top of panels instead of having gutters. They're like composed upon the page three dimensionally which mm -hmm. I don't know if I read it, if that has any relevance to the order of things, but it looks cool. And that's yeah, it looks cool, like symmetrical design there too. I really get the feeling that he was like, oh shit, I've got to do four pages of backstory. And, uh, you know, he is coming up with different ways to present it almost as if this is like a select movie trailer style, you know, and these are, these are sort of like the overlapping cuts yeah. of a, of a trailer. It kind of reminds me of what Everett was doing on Bum, you know, where he mm -hmm. was like using the pages collage. Yeah, it's definitely got that element to it. Uh, I just thought this drawing right here, we talk about sometimes strangely sexy drawings. Um, I thought this was really attractive in a certain kind of way. I'm not sure she exactly. Like sick to me. <laughs> she looks sick. Well, yeah, she's worried, right? It's not, 
it's not intended to be attractive. It's something about the naturalism of the drawing that is attractive, like aesthetically. Uh, um, and I love uh, the and chair then, too. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got the wicker with the bend of the wicker in there right here. This this little detail right here. This, this is the same type of thing as like the curve of her breast or the the curve of her stomach here. Like this is like I'm not saying that these are the same shapes. I'm saying that like the attention to the curve the attention to the nuance of the yeah. of the shifting shape is what makes this attractive although like you're saying depressed <laughs> yeah and and again rhythm for me uh he's always dividing and subdividing and, and subdividing some more and and that's really feels contemporary or ahead of its time in a way that it really impressed me on every, everything i saw when i was flipping through these Um, I'm going to speed up my flip through here and actually just go to my, to my mark. Um, you know, we've got the, thought this was a, a nice little, this is something that Zach did and you can see uh, Gene Day pushing it a little further. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven figures, all supposedly in the same sequence, you know, uh, as part of one figure. Uh, yeah, and that's, that's a more standard comic trick in my mind, but there's something about the, again, the rhythm of the way he designs it and the solidity of the figures that feels, it still feels like he's pushed it somehow. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I can put my finger on how he's pushing that trick exactly. It, in some of them, it's a little more obvious, but. At, uh, at, at the end of this, he's defeated the guy with the help of the former uh, girlfriend. And then this. Um, panel right here i mean it just yes pavane like that so it's speaking and the bubble is pointing to shang chi in the mirror and then he says now tell me why did you assume we were lying and it's him not in the mirror continuing his thought yeah i don't know why oh, this seems that's so weird <laughs> strange to me. that's very strange yeah like the mirror is talking this first I wonder how much his... control he had over that like or if that was a letterous decision uh, no i think he had full i mean he i think he had full script uh they work full script style at least for the issues that he's not credited as the plotter um so i'm, I'm pretty sure that he did the uh did the balloons okay uh prior you know he didn't he didn't hand that off to the letter um but that's uh, interesting i didn't catch that one because i was doing more like large you know quick right. flip through large scale that's interesting Just, something about that seemed very profound to me and a lot of the character conflict is about violence and when do you use violence and like when do you use your skills and there's a lot of lamenting and lost skill because as he becomes more not a pacifist but as he becomes more resistant to conflict he he gets worse at his fighting it's one of the the themes through a lot of the stories i thought this was an interesting one that sort of suggests the character divide just by where the balloons are located well, and quite literally, the idea of self-reflection, mm -hmm. like that's that's a genius visual device for like, yeah, I'm struggling with my inner self in a, in a and quite literally a visual pun on self-reflection. Me meanwhile, we have the cult. The Hulk is selling us, uh, you know, fruit pie. <laughs> <laughs> those fruit pies are hella good. I tried to find those old fruit pies one, and they, they're called something different now, but. I thought this was a quite wild uh, face here. Uh, That's more '90s and, looking. Yeah, <laughs> it is. And then this right here with the the silhouette. This is the same motif that he hits with the cover. You've got the original razor hand behind him with the two hands, and yeah. then these two dudes with the single hand, and they're all forming the shape that she's nested in. And in the in the next issue, there's a really cool thing with that shape too. Next issue. Well, luckily, luckily, what do I have here? <laughs> As always, you get a, a badass cover and a badass intro page. Yeah. <laughs> but then That's on page two, he's got that blade shape for the first three panels, and yeah. then it's <laughs> broken on the third one. Yeah, that's so cool. Because the the first guy has been has been uh, knocked off or captured, they broke his blade, took it off his hand and break it, um, or that's what they're doing right now. 
um, because the, this is actually what's being depicted inside of that <laughs> right there. Yeah, that's just so fantastic. That's amazing to me. Is it's like the panel shape is part of the storytelling device in a more direct way, and that, that's uh, yeah, it's genius, genius. And overload on these uh, cross shadow. I just love this here. I think really Dave drew that one. Dave went over to his studio and he was like, hey, <laughs> Dave, do me do me a moon roach face. <laughs> that's Dave's. That's a Dave moon roach. That, that's, that's exactly uh, what Dave, that's exactly what Dave would have been working on at the exact same time as this. Really? OK, yep. yeah. Dave was over at Gene's studio and they, they were <laughs> drawn on each other. That's a moon roach face for sure. And that type of lighting with the again, the, the shadow from the blinds going across his face. Yeah. I just love it. Absolutely love it. Um, terrible. And the, the women, again, you see the Al Williamson, like Secret Agent X9, like all over that. A yes, little a little bit stiffer in his rendering. He's, right. he's a little bit more in control. And like you said, he's a little bit more attentive to every specificity of the curve, whereas right. Al Williamson is much more likely to abstract it out. And I wonder over time if Gene Day would have loosened up you know, mm -hmm. like, like as him and Dave obsessed, because I know Dave would have been talking to him about it, obsessed about uh, loosening up over the specificity and, and getting the impression without the exactitude. Um, I, I wonder how that would have gone, or if he would have drilled down even more into the specifics. Yeah, you, it, it's, it's an interesting tension, because you can, I, I feel like you can see him coming into his own here. I think that he's probably a little fearful of breaking out from the reference. Um, I mean, this is, clearly reference, you know, possibly just by somebody who was hanging out, maybe it was his wife or something. But um, I, I um, love the sports illustrated. Sports illustrated. <laughs> yeah, I, I love the contrapasto here. And, uh, you know, like the bigger hips and like sort of more straightforward, like it's not this is not like a drawn in a sort of typical like sex pot kind of way, even though the outfit is <laughs> saying that it is. And then just, just the design motif with the circle across here. And you can see a slight callback to it on the right here, a slight awareness of the, the double dancer. page. Yeah. But they're, they're not really using it. He's not using it to full effect here. I just also just, man, that white space. And I didn't get a sense of unless it was a double, because I'm just looking at like a scans of it a page right. at a time, unless it's a double page spread that's stitched together. I'm not seeing those meta compositions between two pages so i'm really curious to see those too what you're talking about there's, there's some of it i think i know what you're talking about but that's a sexy car right there yeah and again raw referenced this one um i don't remember exactly why i flagged flagged this particular one uh, but it's nice snakes are nice. <laughs> i don't know what i saw there but it looks cool probably the fight scene is pretty nice yeah, uh, this one right here. Um, once again, totally, this is so common now. You talk about his time machine. Yeah. Uh, really uncommon, 1980. This, is, this was this moment to moment uh, transition here was basically exclusively the purview of animation. Yeah. Which was a, a, a Gene's, you know, dream. One of his dreams was to, you know, do a hand animation himself. Oh, um, okay. And him and Dave had talked about that as a possibility at various times. Uh, it's worth mentioning this this uh, this issue was not inked by Day uh, entirely. I uh, had somebody else helping out, but uh, I liked this use of the uh, this uh, wall motif here. Well, and that's something that impresses me throughout it is his interest in statuary and culture. So he's not just someone who is exclusively interested in comics and animation and stuff like he, he really seems voraciously hungry for art. And, and right. especially I don't know if it's just because of the plot, but it seems like he's so intent on using statuary as a design element. I, I think that just had to be a fascination of his. Uh, I would speculate. Yeah. And that's impressive. A lot of a lot of people can get just down the hole of only only comics, especially if you're kind of doing like I'm assuming he did this self-taught 
uh, type of route. You're not going through a schooling system and stuff. Uh, right. No, completely self-taught as far as I know. And, um, you know, it, it's interesting, uh, you know, Dave's depiction of him is like a hellraiser who like basically changed his mind and was like, I'm wasting my time on earth, you know, changed his mind in his early twenties and basically became totally devoted to work and totally devoted to productivity uh, is a really interesting, you know, I don't know. I, it, you, you can see him pushing his, his limits and work, you can see the how, work ethic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I liked this page here. Um, not just because of this really gnarly, <laughs> weapon at the bottom here with the spikes which is truly gnarly uh but also the subdivisions he's just like okay this is what i'm gonna get in and he keeps on throwing this sword in to break up you're talking about rhythmical i mean this is just awesome you got the, yeah. the right into the ground he's taking off his armor and they're going back and forth essentially you've got the same viewpoint on each of the three objects through the whole thing um it's just a really nice thing. Also, this guy's name is Carlton Velcro. <laughs> <laughs> Carlton Velcro. Like, does something stick onto his head up there? Is that the Velcro? That's, oh, that's his it. And then the actual fight, you get the gnarly, uh, you get the gnarly weapon. And that's his hand. And, Carlton Velcro's yep. got that on his arm. <laughs> and you got his whole arm. Shit. Uh, you get the close up here. Uh, which he uses so sparingly that when he does, he really goes for it and gives you the, you know, gives you the full Monty. Yeah. Really quite dramatic. But last, Mr. Velcro, we bid you adieu. We're going to skip 107 because neither of us flagged anything interesting about that. Uh, well, it's also you just got to start picking. Like I could have told you something, multiple interesting <laughs> right. things from every issue, but. Like, it's just, like, indications of trends, I guess. Yeah. Uh, we really because could look do at a page-by-page page breakdown. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's really quite inventive. Uh, this one here, you know, you've got uh, Hayes having a hallucination as he's looking at somebody's iguana. And uh, <laughs> I liked he's getting eaten by the iguana, and here's the, the head closing in on him and the shadow closing in on him, and then he breaks up, his body breaks up into little fragments. Yeah, I really like that weird. That was one I almost tagged because it was like, that's such a strange. I think the colorist did him pretty good on that one. Like the weird mm -hmm. little primary color shards. Right. It using looks the like colors. something out of like the Doctor Strange movies now where they're using that psychedelic uh, kaleidoscope looks. Oh, then, uh... yeah. That, that drawing there of the cathedral holy hell i mean i know it's photo reference but it doesn't look like he just photocopied it and manipulated the photocopy on yeah, which a big a big oh, yeah there <laughs> you go it doesn't look like the typical trick of like okay i'm gonna photocopy it and manipulate it he he like traced that mm -hmm. that's all like inked it looks like to me and that's again talking about his work ethic like damn yeah he wants to get it across and he doesn't use teeny tiny lines to do it <laughs> you know uh it's interesting like you can just see he's not even attempting to engage with like the reproduction side of it. it's like well i'm not going to use the stuff that's not going to come up okay you're going to give me the most shitterly printed and colored book possible um you know sometimes the colorist so let me see who are we here yeah so here christy Scheel has taken over now okay and this is um, shooter's girlfriend right and you can see like, so she's decided that this dress should be exposing her breast on this side. And so she's just drawn the color on top of there where there's no contour line. Despite the fact that you can see the dress in the next page is like wrapping around the breast. In other words, the colorist has just made a uniform, a unil unilateral decision to ignore his artwork and try to quote unquote improve something. <laughs> Trying to put like a lighting on it, I guess. I don't know. Or, or she's just decided that since she can see this part of it, she must be able to see this part of it. But why know. would Marvel be like, yeah, make it look like her boobs are hanging out. It's, <laughs> she's trying to do lighting because if you look at the bottom of the dress, it's also. Oh, yeah. I, or she's she trying to make that movie. look a little more lascivious, too, if you ask me. <laughs> it, it's very strange. And then here, you know, we don't have it, it's it doesn't make any sense to me. Um, oh, the leg. The leg is in yeah. shadow. That's supposed to be in shadow. 
I guess so. I mean, it's it, the, there are some odd decisions, and a lot of them just have to seem to do with economics. But like, you know, it just it seems like he cares very much about the book, and the writer cares very much about the book. Doug Monk cares very much about the book, but like the there's an indifference <laughs> about the production side of it. Um, this is a great car right here. Interesting that you throw your girlfriend on there to potentially undermine a guy that you don't like. <laughs> <laughs> And you're like, yeah, talk, talk shit about this. This is my, we should, I want to see how good looking she was. Not that it matters, but I want to see what was like Jim Shooter was like defending, you know? Here, here, here's the, um, here's the uh, sequence I was telling you about before where we got this, uh, you know, gunfire and everything. And then we see through the eyes of the fish, <laughs> we see the fight that's happening. Oh, that's not even the one I was talking about. There's another one where they shoot. Yeah, the the page before. They shoot the fish tank. Oh, right. <laughs> and the fish goes flying out. Yeah. Oh, right there. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I like that. I thought that was funny. And then here we got the through the fish tank. And then he's kicked into the fish tank. We got this great close up here. Obviously, um, Bruce Lee, you know has has become the predominant like visual influence oh yeah he was getting like he was getting like those karate magazines with pictures of bruce lee on right. for sure this uh is... that that fish that through the fish tank scene that would be something you would see on like like breaking bad or something too the cinematography <laughs> the weird camera placement that that those uh what's that guy's name vince gilligan and the whole breaking bad and better call saul teams that also feels like contemporary tv uh, mm -hmm. which is pretty interesting again time machine man where did Wait. what was gene day smoking <laughs> um and then uh we've got the fish splap splap bram <laughs> i love this right here the fish hitting the wall that fish and... is really powerful man it is jumping like it it could leap a tall human in a single bound <laughs> <laughs> something about that one was really uh appealing to me yeah and at the end of the last page uh not to make you go back but there's an interesting thing where like the whole panel is like the shape of the iguana but then the iguana is also facing the other way like inside of itself oh <laughs> that's great <clears throat> which is again like you know if you're gonna have like a hallucinogenic moment like that makes sense like you're inside of yourself yeah that's fantastic We've got um, number 109 here. So we're now almost midway through Gene Day's run. And uh, he died after issue 120 after being fired from the book. Mm. Fired from the book that he was uh, ascending, you know, making the sales get higher and higher and higher. Yeah, and his art was pushing it up the charts. Okay. And uh, I, I noticed a lot of the pages you flagged on this one. It seemed like you liked the uh, card motif. Well, and particularly because in the, uh, I don't know if it's the next issue or a few issues later, they use that card. That, that's where I was saying it starts to look like the writer is looking at Gene Day's design sensibilities and writing stories that include design in them. So there's an right. issue that the story is structured around the playing cards. Uh, that's mm -hmm. why I had tagged that. This is a really interesting page here. Did you flag that because of the deer or because of these great horses? Uh, the, uh, mm, let me get to that one. Probably because of the deer. Because I like, again, that like, uh, yeah, the deer, like that it's like there and then it's a cutout. Yeah. It just seems like an odd choice. It's a really interesting. You're seeing through the deer shape here to the action. And then you see the deer itself. Yeah. And when the soft weight of passive eyes is felt along the ridge of my cheek, I return the passive gaze, seeking an opportunity for a more gentle encounter with an alien creature. No pursuit or flight here. Instead, facing each other, we step forward slowly, joining in trust at a midpoint of common ground. That's why I didn't read the book, because it's doing that 80s thing where the writer is like a really... It's like the Alan Moore thing, you know, the writer is doing really beautiful writing and it's like exposition on next to art. And I just have a personally have a hard time reading books like that anymore. I yeah, it's interesting. It. You, 
it, it, it's it adds to the density of it but from like a pure storytelling perspective you know uh it, it's a it's like different modes of thinking is you know you're required to take take in the text and take in the image and sort of you know the push between them is is heavier when the when the words are trying to do so much work it, um, it can be very powerful it's just i i look at a dense page like that and my brain just unless i'm it, I, it's easier for me to read books like that when I've got them physically. Um, but mm -hmm. even then I just look at a page like that and my brain's like, nah, I could skip that and still understand what's <laughs> going on. <laughs> even though it's not, not true that, you know, you don't get everything, but. It's really clear storytelling here. It's really nice. Um, and the way I that liked... statue. Yeah. Yeah. I thought this was. Panel borders and leaves white is a presence through the whole thing here some nicer coloring here uh we shouldn't totally uh, discount the uh charms of the uh <laughs> <laughs> it's only like it's only because you pre you read you you like have other information oh no I, I i was i was noting the terrible trapping from the very beginning but uh um before before having done any of that research uh I, this is just I mean, <laughs> statuary, I, dude. He loves statuary. I love it. I mean, I, I love that whole section uh, right here. We've got them, you know, in fighting in this tomb. Uh, and we've got that, you know, whole double page spread being dominated by the statuary. And you were buying, you obviously, you were buying these when they came out, or you went back because of, well, like, I would have been with Dave one year old uh at the time this came out so i didn't have much of a uh, uh budget at the time for comics <laughs> but you um, could have understood them because you were a very bright young man <laughs> that's true uh yeah no this is this is all um the dave sim connection for me reading okay. about gene day and service and uh reading about his mentorship of of dave uh in his essays that dave wrote about the guide to self-publishing he really credits gene with freeing him up for basically mentally you need to make as many pages as you can so get rid of your uh insecurities and just do it yeah, because you're gonna important. get better and here's the evidence i mean <laughs> and there's um, your two page like even though they're not a two page spread there's uh symmetry to his design exactly we come in on this very narrow panel and then we've got the the playing out here and then it plays out here with the same balance and then we have the very narrow panel ending it yeah and uh this is the type of stuff that like, you know, it's bizarre to think about, but that is the stuff that was driving his uh, editors crazy. Or at and least three Watchmen where we would have been, oh my God, they're so genius because they did a symmetry issue. Right. Yeah, yeah people weren't, I don't think people, uh, you were, had to be a real committed nerd <laughs> to be looking at page layout, at the, talking about page layout this time. Um, I really like the fight at the end here because uh, this really gets into like blackjack, like crazy story territory where he fights off, uh, fights off the enemy with the bones that he's fallen <laughs> into. <laughs> uh, see, that stuff's hard for me to swallow these days too. It's fun. I don't know though. I just watched some movies that were like that the other night. So I guess I do still like that stuff sometimes. Quite, quite enjoyed that yeah. uh, right there. And then... Uh... But anyways, suck at Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons because Gene Day was up on that symmetrical page. It's just he didn't have a character with a symmetrical mask on, so no one cared. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's obvious that a ton of people were looking at this and like, this is shit we've never seen before. I, and yeah. it's not just the page layouts when I'm talking about J.H. Williams and Andres Soriano. It's it's the 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 use of blacks and all of that like. Uh, I think this guy is the the, the step in, in between that they were looking at that maybe would have got him back to Storenko. Yeah. But there's more than just the layouts. The, his his rendering style, I think, he's a missing a lot of people. He, he's a missing link. And the fact that his stuff wasn't in print for so long is a big part of that. Uh, yeah, so we should mention the reason this wasn't in print is because um, Marvel had a issue-by-issue issue relationship with the Sam Romer a state where they could use Fu Manchu if they paid like 200 bucks an issue. Uh, well, so they established this character with having a dad who's, you know, the character was in the public domain um, at a certain point, but the some of the other stuff weren't. So they had this license that basically they couldn't renew 
without paying a lot of money for. And so these things were not in print until just a couple of years ago, they, they made that series. Uh, I just like the symmetrical, uh, the close up face off with all of the uh, action going across in between and then ending with the big long strip on the top. Which is cool because like in the in the samurai movies, especially in like samurai movies, you'll get the stare down where they're like planning the moves ahead of time and then like they right. act it out. And that's a really cool way to show both at the same time that you couldn't get in a movie. I mean, I guess you could you could you could have like a green screen that has the fight happening behind them, <laughs> but it just works better in comics. Yeah. Once again, he's using the background. Okay, fine. You got exposition. Okay, put it up at the top. I'm gonna draw her face, and I'm gonna draw this cool thing. You know, he's like, he 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 does the exposition as as efficiently as he can. Um, I thought this is there, was. Is there a narrative reason on the page where he's got a big I? Uh, the the letter I is is creating the panels. Hmm. Uh, I don't know what page it is. That... There it is. Oh, on the right. No, I don't think so. That's interesting. Okay, I just I didn't catch that. I just flipped past it now, because a couple pages later he uses right. the word danger for the panels, which is just fantastic. You got the weapon or weapons area danger here, and then we've got indeed the parallel is striking. I've got it nested right there in the word, <laughs> the word yeah. danger with one continuous image in there. I thought that that was a very interesting. And that it's there. threaded, it's threaded from the image before it, like in terms of storytelling is really fascinating. Mm -hmm. Okay, next issue. <laughs> <laughs> this is 111. Another really striking cover. I would love they need to do an artist edition like I don't care do the whole thing just reprint this book as an omnibus in black and white please <laughs> his art doesn't need to be colored this stuff would look great in black and white I was wondering about this here if this might have been a influence on uh, the Dave uh, mountain uh, mountain of skulls yeah it's always uh, like which way did that go it's funny there's some swamp thing and man things in there mm-hmm um, yeah, that looks like something where they were probably both messing around with that. This is April 1982. Now, thought this was a... familiar enough to know when Dave first started drawing the towers. Well, yeah, he had drawn um, in issue two. He has like faces in an underground uh, thing that are very rem reminiscent of that. But yeah. I think the tower itself only appears. Well, no, right around the same time as this, actually. High society, mid high society. It's really hard to you say. You can see the back and forth of this is the other thing that's cool about looking at this is you can see the back and forth of like two geniuses, iron sharpening iron. It's right. like putting two champion level fighters in the same gym. Right. You know, it's it's awesome. And yeah, the animation on that. So this one, we have her falling in perspective and landing on the ground and this guy jet packing up. <laughs> <laughs> and kind of tr like the timing of both too where would they be and like mm -hmm. yeah again uh, who, who was it jim shooter mm -hmm. you'll take a long walk buddy this is amazing storytelling <laughs> i hope we yeah, don't it's... ever want to interview jim shooter no i don't i don't have any interest in interviewing jim shooter i'm sorry okay say. take take a long walk this is amazing storytelling <laughs> uh this is another one where the the composition across the two pages once again, you know, obviously that's something that is done now, uh, you know, ad infinitum, but was um, really interesting, uh, especially here when you've got the train wrapping around the bend <laughs> and uh, you have a plausible, you know, you read this, I don't know, it's, it's interesting to see it like wrap across the spread like that as it's traversing the bridge. It's almost a missed opportunity for me because the cars are panels in and of themselves like he could have had a little bit more of that action across the stable image and then right. framed by each one of the cars like as they're fighting on the train that would have been right. cool well you, you see some of that on the top here uh, but not across the, pa the panels he's using the top from 
you know, yeah. the, each of the views is discrete. He could have done it on the train though, and that would have looked mm-hmm. really great because the train provides panels. Bike race. <laughs> <laughs> that is so referenced. <laughs> That's like whoever was before Lance Armstrong. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I I like this. This this uh, set off my T.J. Hooker uh, alarm. Uh, T.J. Hooker, the uh, early '80s uh, Shatner uh, vehicle. The first season of that has a basically every episode has to have a chase scene uh, where he chases somebody on a different vehicle. And by the end of the first season, they've run out of vehicles, so he like jumps over a toy train, and you know, it's like stuff like that. You know, what this like makes the- me think of that scene in the Goonies where uh, <laughs> yeah. where Thanos, young Thanos, has to grab a has to grab a little kid's bike, and he's riding the little kid's bike, with Josh <laughs> Brolin, <laughs> and he's got the headband on too, like that. This extreme close up here, I just love it. I love the deformity of his face coming up into the extreme close-up and that it's over two panels i can see yep. that if shooters pissed off by that it's why are you have a face over two panels just draw this <laughs> one panel brandon would hate that too i think brandon <laughs> doesn't like that pan if it's going to be a continuous image like he thinks, that's interesting you know, especially on like if that train panel had had multiple uh figures on it he doesn't like or like the stairs where he breaks the panels out just have him walk down the stairs the reader can see, figure it out he it's interesting he's doing it right here so that you know that this this seek you know how to read the sequence because look the fist is leading you into the second across the uh, page exactly so that yeah because otherwise this would not be you know readable and and it wasn't possible to do registration across the page so he wouldn't be able to do a full bleed that actually connected through there uh because of all how terrible the trimming was oh on the Um, digital copy i have it's just a single image all the way across there's no panel border oh interesting so some somewhere it was done all the way across. Yeah, that's him. Telling, somebody... That's to him telling shooter, okay, this is how you lead him across. The same thing with the death across the bottom. Right. Like, I'm just saying know, that it's he... it's so misregistered that I, I can yeah. see why somebody would avoid doing it very often. This is just fantastic. I mean, I just love this. This is the countdown here. Once again, the numbers telling you what direction to read it. <laughs> but we got a countdown, and it ends with the ten. And they're, they're split up in the 10, so you see them both at the same time. And then death. <laughs> well, the death, the death makes it one unified image. So it's, again, like, like, okay, you have a problem with me doing double page spreads. People are, like, misreading it. Let me show you how to solve that problem. Like, shut right. up. <laughs> um, pe- people have criticized Dave's narrative. Specifically, Jim Shooter has pushed back a little bit against J- Dave's narrative. Uh, about Gene's life and their relationship and everything. But, you know, having worked with him for a long time, I can tell you that like Dave has an amazing specificity of memory. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And he specifically wrote about um, talking to, to Gene. Uh, and Gene said, Shooter sent one of my layouts to Archie Goodwin. And Archie said it was unreadable. And Dave said, what are you talking about? you know, Archie said that's unreadable. And Dave, who had a personal relationship with Archie Goodwin, called up Archie Goodwin on the phone and said, hey, did you say this was unreadable? And he said, no, I told him it looked great. Uh, I wonder what else was going on there that like, what other personal drama was happening that he was just picking on the guy? Well, I mean, I don't know. You know, Shooter inherited a weird situation at Marvel where it really was like the editor, the sub editors were had their own books and could do whatever the hell they wanted to. And I, I think he quite rightly thought that he needed to have like a, you know, a, a saner ship or, or, a, a, you know, he needed to run a tighter ship. More cohesive um, unit. Right. But the question is like, what do you lose when you do that? Especially as somebody like Gene, who was so devoted to his work. I mean, why wouldn't you want to cultivate this guy? Well, and if it's um, blown up sales, then just like, let him do his thing, bro. Yeah. Let it run. Right. Shang Chi is not messing up the X Men continuity. Exactly. He does. He's not. He's not messing with anything. Right. Um. I, I just love this whole page right here. I mean, I just. It's really something else, and you can see the tracing paper, the necessity of tracing paper to work this yeah. out. Because it, you imagine working these tiny figures exactly how you want them, and then realizing they're like a centimeter too far to the left. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? And it's it's a, it's a way of like. I always call it visual entendre where you can get like 
two or three meanings out of one image. Um, it's a way to pack a density of in information into a page that I just am always fascinated by any trick that does that. Right, because uh, because this would be a a fantastic fight scene in terms of the staging and like jumping onto the thing of a helicopter and everything. No matter, I mean, the way it's drawn, just plainly presented, this would be an impressive fight scene. He takes yeah. the impressive fight scene and he nests it in with this feeling of doom by creating each of these shapes independently in there. I mean, it just it just ramps it up, you know, so far. Yeah. And again, I would love to see this all in black and white. Yeah. Yeah, the color is not doing any favors for it. Uh, one other thing I wanted to mention when I'm looking at this spread right here is uh, Dave has mentioned quite rightly that uh, pointed out that Gene took a big pay cut by agreeing to pencil this book. And the reason for that is because he was such a fast inker uh, and not a fast penciler. Uh, and uh, and so you could <laughs> really get the idea why when you look at this, how many figures are on this double page spread? We're talking one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. 24 figures, like eight helicopters. <laughs> well, and not just that, but like making sure that you're composing within non-standard picture planes in a way that work like you're composing right. inside of a, a number five and that's that's yeah. very bizarre but again you get guys like jh williams now or andreas or i i keep fucking up that guy's name i'm sorry but um i think that's his name uh who routinely compose inside of shapes within the page and, and that always blows my mind too because i'm such a like okay i got a rectangle <laughs> right <laughs> so, so it's this not is just a, i have to draw a figure i have to solve my way through a, a hard right. design problem so that's that's a 111 and uh he uh took a break for two issues and we'll which, skip those <laughs> yeah and uh gene day was back at 114 he did the covers for 112 and 113 but 114 he is back in full effect and he, he feels have... refreshed because then he really starts i mean Actually, you know what we should do? We'll we'll cut it here. Yeah. Because we're going on. And this will be a second video. Uh, because right. he comes back, he comes back refreshed and goes even harder, I think. Yeah. Look so forward to that. Check in back video. in in the next video <laughs> for Gene Day going even more ham. Even genier. Yeah. All right, guys. Uh, is, thanks is, for following along. Thank you. <laughs> And you get them.